Hi, I'm Matt Miller with Associated Earth Sciences, uh, geotechnical engineer. I'm a principal uh, geotechnical engineer. I've been with them for about 17 years. And we've been doing a lot of infiltration work in around the Puget Sound for a number of years. And it started back when a lot of the, the master plan developments and things uh, weren't going to happen unless we could put water back in the ground. So it's kind of evolved a lot since then. But what I'm going to do, most of these guys are talking about the surface. You've heard a lot about the surfacing. What I want to do is take you down below uh, the pavement surface and get you into the mode of site selection and what has to happen in that process before we actually come up with the final design. So there's, you know, uh, Chris and Curtis talked about, you know, the, the difference between, you know, infiltration and then recollection systems also. So there's, you know, Puget Sound is very blessed with our, our soil conditions here, uh, but also some kind of curse too with our tills. Um, so we've got certain soil conditions that would enhance infiltration versus uh, uh, recollection. Again, in the, the Department of Ecology Manual, in the Volume 3, Section 3.3.5, they kind of go through the site characterization criteria. So kind of the, the bullet points for that are the geology and soil characteristics, groundwater conditions, infiltration potential, and kind of the mounting analysis. So that's kind of generally what they're looking for in site selection, site assessment, into looking at, at whether a, a permeable system or pervious system is gonna, actually going to work. And right off the bat, site exploration is really the, the one of the more critical pieces of the whole process. So whether it's a big plat, whether it's a, a linear project, such as a sidewalk or a roadway, getting enough soil information up front so we can determine whether we can put things back in the ground or it may not be something we want to use for a specific application. Kind of taking a step back um, just so I can get my terminology with everybody. Really, we've got kind of two major soil classifications, I guess, to, to put it really broadly. Outwash soils and non-outwash. So kind of the non-outwash type material would be the glacial tills, which are, you know, very dense. Let's take a step back here. The, the geology here is kind of a layer cake type system, right? So we have the, the more recent deposits sitting up on top, which is the, the recessional outwash. Uh, below that typically is a till, which is our hard pan derived from the, the base of the glacier you know, we're, we're sitting at about 3,000 feet below the top of the glacier at one point. So, you know, we've got 3,000 feet of ice sitting on top of us next to what compressed that glacial till. So, again, real hard material. Uh, infiltration rates are, are measured in, in inches per year versus uh, inches per hour. Um, so we like to, you know, reuse that for, for berms, for um, liners, that type of stuff. So it kind of gives you an idea of the, the potential for till. Below that is, a, is another uh, compressed unit, which is an advanced outwash. It's a typically a dense sand and gravel, um, but we do have a lot of potential for infiltration in that unit. So a lot of times the till can be a little fairly thin, and we can actually get through it in some cases. Maybe a large plat where we're doing some grading. Uh, we may grade away the till, and we may expose um, the advanced outwash down below. The things that you want to kind of be careful with with the advanced outwash is there, you know, just due to its depositional environment, there's a lot of thin layers of silt um, that can kind of, there's stringers that go along that are discontinuous, so a lot of times we can actually puncture those and, and allow the water to go sideways. So again, there's different opportunities and different, different layers. The one thing you need to be cautioned about in the recessional outwash is near the surface is, again, in grading, you can remove it and take care of or get rid of a lot of your potential infiltration uh, area by taking away the recessional getting down to the till. So exploration, three basic ways that we like to use exploration pits, fairly economical. We can do a lot in one day. We're able to grab samples fairly easily, but we'll also be able to see, you know, firsthand what's in the pit. Uh, we can see those stringers of silts that might inhibit flow. Exploration pits are really a, a, one of the, the more popular way to go. Vector explorations, we found this to be a really good tool uh, when we're doing um, upgrades in the city environment where we're in uh, median strips, uh, the planting strips where we've got utilities to deal with. We start digging with borings or backhoes. Vactor pit works really well so we don't have to worry about hitting utilities. But we're still getting the, the information we need. We'll take a hand auger out, back down a couple of feet and grab samples with a hand auger or something like that. Last but not least would be the borings. Typically we're looking at facilities that might be a little bit deeper, maybe on a, a larger grading project where we're actually going to take away, you know, upwards of 10, 12, 14 feet, something like that where we can't feasibly get to with a backhoe then we're using the explorations uh, but again drilling you're you're looking at a much smaller diameter hole uh, we're sampling even a smaller so our, our drill is you know eight to ten inches in diameter and we're actually sampling with a standard penetration tube or SPT test which is actually about an inch and a half so your your sample return is fairly minimal um, 
But again, when we're drilling, uh, we highly encourage doing continuous sampling, which is we're driving the sample tube ahead of the auger. Kind of a standard of practice in a lot of geotech explorations is standard at, at about five feet of intervals for your actual sampling. We need to do a continuous sample, so we're actually seeing all the different layers. We're grabbing samples along the way for a grain size distribution. So again, we'll kind of show a little bit later here the, the advantages of having some grain size distribution so we can kind of predict or have an indication of infiltration uh, capability. More in the grand scale of things, these are basically sources that we can get to online. The USGS and the uh, DNR uh, put together a great collection of maps online. Uh, the statewide program with uh, DNR now has is, is integrated a lot of the, the uh, boring information from the City of Seattle on uh, the UW. Uh, they put together a, a great um, collection of borings from geotechnical reports all over the Puget Sound. Some of the well logs from Ecology, another great source, although you've got a lot of different people that are logging the holes, uh, well drillers and uh, geologists, so there's a, a kind of a, a wide range of, of different descriptions, but it's also a good indication. When you're doing your exploration, you, you have your, your site-specific information that you're gathering, but we also need to look at a much grander scale uh, because what we need to know is where the water might go once it does go into the ground. So. Uh, are we affecting steep slopes off-site? Are we um, contributing to a wetland? Are we doing, uh, affecting off-site properties with uh, you know, drainage issues, that sort of thing? So again, what we're looking at, and the manual kind of alludes to this, is you're looking for indications or responses to infiltration up to at least 500 feet away from your site. Another great tool is the LIDAR images. You can see that, I believe that's on the right-hand side there. So the LIDAR image is a great tool for us really see, you can get down and, and see what land formations might be there for old landslides. You can really, they really pop out uh, in a LIDAR image. So once we go out, we have determined that we've got soils that we might want to try to infiltrate in, typically an outwash soil. Along with that assessment is the groundwater elevation. So take a step back here. Uh, if it show, if the site assessment shows that five feet of separation of groundwater, uh, if you have that below your facility, uh, we don't need to monitor. Um, but there are areas in the Puget Sound where, uh, and I think the, the, the local geology people will know that we can get fluctuations of up to five feet in our groundwater. Marysville is a kind of a good area for that. You can get several feet of fluctuation in a groundwater table throughout the, the season. So again, knowing your, your potential for that fluctuation, knowing your separation between that and a perch layer, uh, whether it's the, you know, through your recessional outwash into your till, um, and again, most sites, if we do have, or all sites, if we are in that situation where it's questionable, um, the requirement would be that you have a, a winter monitoring um, period to make sure we catch the high. Um, a note on that, there's a couple of ways to do that. So we put in monitoring wells during the uh, fall, summer, but those need to stay in through the winter months. So again, you can go out, you can monitor them, hand dip them periodically, but most people like to go out and measure their monitoring wells when it's nice and sunny out. Nobody ever wants to do it when it's been raining for a long time. We typically will catch a lower elevation of the groundwater, especially if we have a real fast response to precipitation. We like to encourage people to put in uh, like a data logger. They're fairly inexpensive, um, and you can get continuous readout uh, of that water table elevation throughout the period of the winter months. So you can set it for you know anywhere from 30 seconds to several days, but you get a continuous readout. And that can help you in a lot of, a lot of situations. First off, you're gonna get that high that you may have missed during the monitoring period, but can also show if, if, the, if the water table does come up real high and close to your facility, uh, but you can show that it, it drains away really quickly. Uh, that can help a lot of times in the design and, and getting through the, the rough points of having a separation that's too close. Next, once you found an area that you are interested in trying to do infiltration, infiltration testing is the next step. We do have a, a, a method in the manual where we can do a grain size distribution test, and there's a formula that allows you to come up with a, a ballpark uh, number for infiltration. We kind of encourage people to use that with caution and use the correction factors and variabilities along with that. Again, that's only valid for a recessional outwash or Holocene deposit where our recent deposit, say alluvial environment. Once you get into the fine grain soils, uh, this formula kind of falls apart, so to speak, uh, and it's not recommended, so we need to get into and then a couple of the others are the small scale falling head test, which is kind of the old fashioned way. Ecology is put forward now, the larger ring style, the large and small pilot pit test. So I kind of went through the, the grain size distribution again. 
Um, what you're pulling off of here are the different grain size along the way. So your, your fines, your F sub fines is your minus 200 material. That's this 200 screen. Your D90, your D60, your D10. Um, those are the size of the particle of which 10% pass, 60%, and 90% pass. So those are going to be in millimeters. We get back to the old-fashioned test, EPA falling head, six-inch diameter standpipe test. Still, in a lot of people's minds, the way to go. Caution against this in a situation where we have a fairly large-scale um, infiltration facility or a large-scale uh, uh, permeable pavement uh, application. Um, especially if we get into a, a cobbly environment, drive that six inch tube down in the ground and we hit a boulder, we have a pretty low rate, we move over six inches, we hit a pocket of sand, we get a high infiltration rate, can be extremely variable and caution against any of that kind of uh, testing just because of the, the environment. You know, it, it can be useful in a, in a situation where we have real consistent sand deposits, beach deposit, that kind of thing. Uh, but again, knowing your environment and knowing the limitations of the test. Uh, but this test is not used or not recommended by the ecology for in the new manual. Another old-fashioned test that was in, an option for a long time is the double ring infiltrometer. Uh, you still hear this once in a while, but it's pretty much gone by the wayside. If you notice on the slide, there's graduated cylinders in there, so we're you know measuring water in, in cubic centimeters and milliliters. So again, the volume you might want to put in is going to be a lot different than something. Uh, in, a, in a double ring infiltrometer. So again, these two tests, to me, very small scale, almost laboratory scale type stuff, still in use today, but not recommended.